I am very excited to welcome Yasha Monk and EJ Dion back to Politics and Prose. Uh, Yasha Monk is here to talk about his new book, The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger, and How to save it. Um, as the Cold War drew to a close in 1989, Francis Fukuyama's The End of History posited that liberal democracy had won and would be the final ideological form, but almost 30 years later, we see that this is not, in fact, the case. Um, dr dr drawing on recent examples from the U.S. and Europe, Monk demonstrates how, as liberalism and democracy come apart, they tend towards extremes of either an illiberal democracy under the sway of populist demagogues or an undemocratic li liberalism run by t technocratic elites. Yasha Monk is the author of The Age of Responsibility and is a lecturer at Harvard, um, as well as a senior fellow in the political reform program at New America. He is joined today in conversation by E.J. Dion, um, a Washington Post columnist and co-author of One Nation After Trump, which we also have many copies of here at the store. So, Bless so you. please give a warm welcome to Yasha Monk and E.J. Dion. Thank you, Isaac. I asked him to plug our book so I wouldn't have to. So that was very uh, kind of him. Thanks, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to a lot of old friends I see here. Uh, today, uh, I just want to say Politics and Prose arranges some of the very best conversations on the crisis facing democracy uh, and on public problems generally. And I think if we could locate a Politics and, pro and Prose in every community in the United States and across the democracies, we wouldn't have, Ayasha wouldn't have had to write this uh, book. Uh, I'm also really happy to be here because like many of you, I have become a Yasha fan. Uh, over the last several years. I admire his sharp mind and warm heart, and both of them are important. Uh, and he comes at his concern for liberal democracy and his commitment to a greater degree of social justice from both personal experience and deep and serious philosophical reflection. That earlier book of his is really good too if they have it around here uh, today. He'll sign them both, I'm sure, if you <laughs> care to buy one. Um, I just, what I want to do, uh, what we're going to do today is have a conversation up here. He and I have been talking about this book for a while. Indeed, he was kind enough to visit with my students up at Harvard where I taught last semester and gave them an advanced look at some of the chapters of the book. And we had a wonderful conversation there. And he and I have had friendly discussions, including a couple of arguments that I'm going to service here, friend, very friendly arguments, uh, one over populism, uh, and the other over the role of young people uh, in the future. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, but first, I want Yasha to have a chance to introduce the book. I am going to read, um, every author should have a paragraph like this in the book that very neatly summarizes the core argument, in this case of the first half, of what the problems are. So I'm going to read this. And then I'm going to ask Yasha to tell you a bit about himself. Because, as I say, his commitment on these issues comes from his own background. He became an American citizen last year, correct? We should welcome Yasha with a round of applause. We are, Thank you. We are very lucky to have him. Um, and I want him to talk about sort of his background a bit and how he came to write this book. Then we will get to uh, 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 some of the issues. But first, my uh, dramatic reading. Um, Once upon a time, liberal democracies could assure their citizens of a very rapid increase in their living standards. Now, they no longer can. Once upon a time, political elites controlled the most important means of communication and could effectively exclude radical views from the public sphere. Now, political outsiders can spread lies and hatred with abandon. And once upon a time, the homogeneity of their citizens, or at least a steep racial hierarchy, was a big part of what held liberal democracies together now citizens have to learn how to live in a much more equal and diverse democracy. Uh, welcome, Yasha, and please tell folks a bit about yourself and how you came to write this book. Like at what moment after, uh, how many hours after either Brexit or Trump's election did you decide uh, to write this uh, book? Well, well, I think what's sort of interesting and surprising is that I started to write this book before either Brexit or Trump happened. Um, other people weren't so interested in me writing the book at the time. 
um, because they kind of thought I was a little bit of a weird crank. Um, when I started to, to, to argue three, four years ago uh, that there's real warning signs for our democracies, not just in the United States, but in big parts of Europe as well, uh, people always accused me of being a Cassandra. Um, and I wanted to respond, for I didn't, because I realized they would just give, you know, dig me even deeper into the hole. Cassandra was right, damn it. <laughs> that's the whole point of Cassandra. Um, that's his next book. That's my <laughs> Cassandra was right, damn it, exclamation mark. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, why is it that I was sort of more alive to those dangers than, than some other people? I think a mix of a personal story and some academic interest of mine. I mean, so, you know, personally, uh, my, my family has had the bad habit of being in the wrong place at the wrong time for these three generations. Um, so I've seen, uh, you know, in, with my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my parents, how, uh, you know, the political situation ended up being quite differently from what they expected and how they affect, that affected their own lives. So I think, you know, to me, the idea that political systems can turn and that that can have quite tragic consequences in a very personal way is, is, is concrete rather than abstract. Um, and that I think probably anticipating a little bit what part of our conversation might be later separates me from many of the people in my generation who grew up in the United States or, who grew up, or other people who grew up in big parts of Europe. The other thing is that as an academic, I started to think about how people actually feel about our political system. Now, what people have known for a long time is that uh, approval ratings for Congress and for particular politicians keep getting lower, that participation in formal politics gets lower, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, uh, that uh, people, the approval ratings for, for Congress, for the Supreme Court, for presidency have been sinking, that 40 years ago people trusted politicians and now we don't anymore in the majority. So that was all clear. But, but with a colleague of mine, Roberto Four, we started to look at how do people actually feel about the political system itself? So do they say it's important for them to live in a democracy? Are they open to authoritarian alternatives to democracy? And we started to see that those attitudes have started to shift as well. That actually fewer young people now say it's really important for them to live in a democracy. That the number of people who say, I want a strongman leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament or elections, or even, I think army rule is a good system of government, has gone up significantly. And so, uh, you know, when we saw that a few years before Trump was elected, we really started to worry about what's going on. When you look back at where opinion was in a lot of the West uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Ed Luce in his wonderful book has a wonderful description of journeying uh, to the wall, very excited with a bunch of students, and there was a feeling that, aha, liberal democracy has finally triumphed, a lot of these problems have disappeared, and uh, there is nothing but success on the horizon. Um, what happened? What happened? Uh, and why were these predictions so wrong? What, did people, what were people missing in 1989? Or did developments afterward change the trajectory? Yeah, so the obvious way to frame this is around Francis Fukuyama's argument, The End of History, which said that for the first time um, in living memory, there was no real ideological competitor to liberal democracy. In the 19th century, there had been absolute monarchy, but to some degree been theocracy. In the 20th century, it was fascism and communism. All of those had failed, and in 1989, though Fukuyama never claimed that democracy was everywhere or that there would no longer be any historical events, but some misreading of what he was saying, he said... Fukuyama has a blurb on the back. Yes, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> he, he was saying, look, there's no real system that people would rather live in. People are deeply committed to liberal democracy as a system, and so we don't really have to worry about its persistence. Now, even some people who are skeptical of Fukuyama actually bought that core thesis for big parts of North America and Western Europe. So political scientists who would, you know, were very empirical and counting you know, numbers and playing around in state and R, they, they might have thought, oh, the end of history, you know, what a silly phrase, but they actually had the same belief. So there's a famous article by somebody called Adam Shavorsky in the 90s who said, look at all of the democracies that have over $15,000 GDP per capita, would have had at least two changes of government for free and fair elections. Well, you know what? All of those places are safe. You no longer have to worry about the persistence of a democratic system in those countries. And those reliant on the assumption that democracy had become consolidated, which is a phrase in literature, which would mean that it was the only game in town. And that's precisely what we set out 
to test and what we described, what I described to some degree in this book, which is, is it still true that everybody gives this importance to democracy? Is it still true that people reject those alternatives to democracy out of hand? And most importantly, are there any politicians and political movements that, uh, that actually have real power in the system and reject the most basic rules and norms of liberal democracy? And there it's been obvious for a long time, but that's no longer the case. But populists had been rising, not just here and there in American primaries, where they sort of shot up for a little moment and then crashed again. Uh, think of all of the extreme candidates that briefly led the pack in Republican uh, primary fields, not just in 2016, but in 2012 and 2008, and so on and so forth. But you also saw a very steady rise of populism in Europe for a long time. In a paper with somebody who's here today, Martin Eiermann, we show that uh, the share of populist parties in Europe has increased from about 8% in the year 2000 to 25% uh, more recently. And so uh, the whole world on which we based the conviction that we don't have to worry about democracy anymore after 1989 went far beyond Fukuyama. And I think it's now been challenged in ways that go far beyond Donald Trump. A few weeks back, Rob Ryman was here to talk about his book, The Fight Against the Age. He thinks it's actually important that we call this uh, new right-wing nationalism by its name, and he believes that name is fascism. Uh, do you agree with that um, or, or not? And how do you analyze? What is the nature of this ideology? I, I disagree with Rob on this, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, the first is that um, it's really easy to think of the collapse of democracy as requiring something like what happened in Germany in the 1930s, right? So we're only going to lose democracy if lots of people give a Hitler salute, you know, buy really big, ugly black boots, um, and run through the center of town with torches, right? And some of that happens. Some of that exists. And when you look at Charlottesville, there's obviously people who quite openly um, are fascists in, in, in our country today. But... You know what, despite all the horribleness of what happened in Charlottesville, if that was the only danger we faced, I wouldn't be too concerned. I wouldn't be writing this book. What you see, though, in countries from Russia to, um, to Turkey, in countries today like Poland and Hungary, is that there's many other ways in which democracy can come under real attack. And those are lot much more subtle. It's not people who say, uh, I'm a fascist, I want to get rid of democracy. It's people who say, you know what, you've been disempowered, People have taken the real power away from you, and I'm the only real Democrat. I alone actually represent the people. I am your voice, as Donald Trump said in the Republican National Convention. So give me your vote so that I can return power to the people. And that, I think, is the real danger to, to democracy at the moment. So calling it fascist is, makes us lazy because we think, well, there's nobody in, in black boots and torches in the streets, so why should we worry? And I think it, 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 it makes it more difficult for us to understand the specific nature of populism. Now, here we have a disagreement, um, as perhaps some of you saw, saw EJ's excellent column in Washington Post um, about a week ago, um, in which he basically says there's good forms of populism. Now, you know, the word populism is a little confusing, um, and, and, you know, there are some people who have historically been called populists, who are sometimes called populists now, who I think can contribute a certain corrective to the system. But the way that I describe populism in this book and the way that I can make sense of it, um, I don't think that there is such a good thing as good populism. And the reason is the following. What is a populist at heart? It's not somebody who says, there's certain things wrong with our politicians and some of them are corrupt and some of them are self-serving and it's really important that we win in order to make improvements for you. That's a normal part of politics. That was Barack Obama as much as anybody else, right? Talking about a rigged system and so on. There's nothing dangerous about that. But what populists have uniquely is that they say, only I truly represent the people. The only reason why we have any real political problems at the moment is that politicians are corrupt and self-serving. And I can fix all of that because I stand for ordinary people. I manage to channel their wisdom and their views. And this means that anybody who opposes me, who disagrees with me, is by definition illegitimate. So give me all of the power, and if the courts are going to stand up to that, because what I'm doing is unconstitutional, then they are being un-American. Right? If the media is criticizing me, then they're enemies of the people. 
if your position is trying to use its institutional prerogatives to limit how much I can do, then they are traitors. And this is true of populists in different countries and of different stripes. Donald Trump and Recep Erdogan and Hugo Chavez don't have much in common. For example, Donald Trump doesn't seem to be overly fond of Muslims, whereas Recep Erdogan doesn't seem to be overly fond of anybody who's not a Muslim. But they share this trait. They share the trait of saying, the only reason why we have political problems is that the elites are corrupt. I represent ordinary people and I can solve it, but to do that, you have to give me all of the power because anybody who disagrees with me is a traitor, is illegitimate. And that kind of populism will always be a danger to the basic principles of liberal democracy, and that's why I think it's always going to be dangerous. I don't want to pursue this too far because I want uh, Yasha to have a chance to present the rest of his book. But just for fun, I want to just take this one, one time, which is, in a way, isn't your argument about populism in contradiction to the argument about fascism? Because what Rob's argument is, is you don't have to wear jackboots or sing the horse vessel song uh, to be a fascist. And that, in fact, the danger may be hidden from us because people are doing it in the name of democracy. And after all, um, the word Vogue that Hitler uh, invoked was the people. Uh, and so there is, uh, so I, I'm, I just want to pursue that. And then on the populist side, um, I, I, I would basically assert, and we, that this is why we probably shouldn't go too long on this, populism is an essentially contested concept. And I think that there are those who see populists more in, Ameri in the terms of our old American populist movement, which was largely a democratizing movement, and I think there's actually a difference across the oceans on this as well, which is I think Europeans, uh, because of the nature of the right-wing populism you face, uh, are more likely to see populism as anti-democratic. So just take that, and then I want to just pursue a couple arguments in the book, and I want to let this learned audience uh, participate as well. So look, there's certainly certain similarities between some forms of populism and some forms of fascism, but, but there are essential differences as well. One of them is how openly hostile fascism is to democracy, which, yes, the fact that I agree that populism is covertly hostile to, to democracy, but, um, but fascism has always been openly hostile to it. And that's an important thing to understand. And so if we think, is this like fascism? We're going to say, well, Donald Trump is not overtly hostile to democracy, so why does anybody worry? We're all Toronophobes, as some people have charged, right? And that's, that's a real mistake. That really makes it more difficult for us to understand. There's also a crucial difference in the kind of forms of political regime that those countries tend to institute. So there, there, there's an important distinction between um, dictatorships and totalitarian regimes, right? Most fascist systems tend to be totalitarian regimes, which is to say that every sphere of politics and society becomes deeply imbued with ideological fervor. You cannot have a chess club that isn't organized along fascist lines. Right? And that is the same in communism. Um, now, I think populists don't tend to erect regimes like that. When you think of Turkey, when you think of Russia, there are places where as long as you don't criticize the government, as long as you don't pose a, a threat to the dictator, you get to do whatever you want. And so, again, I think populism and fascism actually erect systems that are very different as well. Now, look, I, I agree with you. This, this concept of essentially contested is important, right? There's no one natural way of defining democracy. There's no one natural way of defining populism. In a way, it is a question of which definition allows us to understand what's going on in the world the best at the moment. And what I would say is that, um, for I understand there's different kinds of movements being called populist in, the, in American history, I don't think that that is very useful as a term at the moment. Because what we need to understand is why is all of this stuff happening around the world? Why do you see Erdogan in Turkey? Why do you see Viktor Orban in Hungary? Why do you see Marine Le Pen in France? Why do you see Donald Trump in the United States all at the same time? And the best way of making sense of that, I think, is to use my understanding and the understanding of some of the academic literature on populism, because that precisely brings out the very important commonalities between people who also have some important differences to each other. Let's uh, go through uh, some of the core arguments of the book. Um, you talk, uh, and, and let's sort of start with um, economics versus immigration, and we've talked about this before. One of the hardest things, I think, to sort through is whether this surge was caused by a globalized economy, economic 
uh, distress the decline of upward mobility, particularly here in the U.S., um, or whether the driving force, uh, even more than economics, uh, was a fear of widespread immigration, a backlash against widespread immigration. On the side of the immigration, uh, the primacy of immigration um, would be the idea that some of these movements have shown up in places like the Netherlands, which have fairly well-distributed economic growth um, uh, relative to uh, other countries. Um, but I, I'd like you to sort of parse uh, economics versus immigration and, and maybe give people a sense of some of what you talk about as solutions to these, pro these dilemmas. So first of all, in trying to understand why is all of this happening at the moment, I took inspiration from a story that at first has nothing to do with populism or Donald Trump, so it's a nice little respite, uh, told by Bertrand Russell. He said, well, once upon a time, there was a chicken on a farm. And it led a very nice life. It was the kind of chicken we'd all like to eat for dinner, which is to say that, you know, it got to run around freely and do whatever it wanted. Um, and, and, but all the other animals on the farm kept warning it and said, be careful, one day the farmer is going to come and kill you. And the chicken said, what are you talking about? The farmer's been nice to me all of my life. He's always fed me and muttered some encouraging words. Why would things suddenly be so different? Well, Russell in his nice wit says uh, that eventually, of course, the chicken did learn that he was wrong. The, the farmer came to wring the chicken's neck showing that more sophisticated views as to the uniformity of causation would have been to the chicken's benefit. <laughs> what, what does he mean by that, right? What are more sophisticated views as to the uniformity of causation? Well, what he meant is quite simple. There's scope conditions on how the social world works, right? As long as the chicken was too thin to be taken to the market, the farmer had an incentive to keep feeding it. Once it was big enough to, to fetch a decent price, how he behaved was going to change. Now, why is it that liberal democracy has been incredibly stable around the world for the last 50 or 60 years, and now we start to see it seemingly be less and less stable? Well, let's look at the scope conditions. What was true for these past 50, 60 years that is no longer true? And it seems to me that there's three big things there, and they're sometimes put in competition with each other, but all of the interesting phenomena in human history have always had more than one cause. The world is not monocausal, right? So the first is um, living standards. In the United States, from 1935 to 1960, the living standards of the average American doubled. From 1960 to 1985, they doubled again. Since 1985, they've been stagnant. Now, that makes a real difference about how people perceive politics. They used to say, well, you know what? Um, I don't love politicians. You know, this belt with this Washington, D.C. stuff. You know, it's a little weird. But in the end, they seem to be delivering for me. Right? They seem to be sticking to their end of a deal, so let's give them the benefit of a doubt. Now people are saying, am I allowed to swear in this bookstore? I think I'll, I'll swear once and see whether they shut off my microphone. Um, now people are saying, you know what? I've worked really hard all of my life. I don't have much to show for it. I think my kids are going to be worse off than me. Let's throw some shit against the wall and see what sticks. How bad can things get? How mild that is compared I know, to the standards in our country right now. <laughs> If it weren't for Trump, it would have gotten a better reaction. Um, now, look, the counter-argument against this, and this has been reser researched a lot in the, in the media and so on, is to say, oh, but it's not necessarily true that people who voted for Donald Trump were much poorer than those who voted for Hillary Clinton. Granted. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, that's a really bad test of whether economic causes matter. What's interesting is that not just in the United States, but in many parts... Uh, uh, in many countries, populists are doing very well around the world. You see a very clear distinction between urban and economically uh, dynamic parts of a country and others. So in the United States, Donald Trump won over two-thirds of American counties, but something like one-third of America's GDP. He did much better in parts of a country where there's very little recent investment, where people are less educated. Even where the share of jobs that are subject to automation in the coming decades is much higher. Because people there realize, I might still be doing fine, but I have a lot to fear from the future. Now, the second course has to do with, with culture and ethnicity and immigration. This is really stark in Europe, where most countries became stable democracies at a time 
when they were more homogeneous than at previous parts of their history because of a tragic effect of World War II, and in which they had a clear mono-ethnic, monocultural conception of who really belongs. When you asked a, a, a German where I grew up, a, an Italian and a Swede in 1960, who really belongs to the country, it would have been obvious that it's somebody who's descended genetically from the same set of people, that it certainly isn't somebody who's brown or black, somebody who's Muslim or Hindu. Now, thankfully, that started to change over the last 50 or 60 years. There has been a lot of immigration, and people have actually started to adapt more liberal un understandings of citizenship and of belonging. But there's also a strong reaction against that. And though I don't for a moment condone that reaction, and, and none of us should, I think it's actually easy to understand why that would be the case. If you say, hey, I may not be the richest guy, I may not have the best education, you know, I may not have the most social respect, but at least I'm better than that immigrant over there, right? At least I have a higher social status than them. Well, and now, thankfully, there's politicians who are immigrants or children of immigrants. You might go to your, to, to your work and your boss might be an immigrant. Well, the fact that some people feel like they've lost something there, that some social standing has been taken away, actually isn't too surprising. Right? Now, the United States is both similar and different. It's different because we've always been a multi-ethnic society. There's always been many different ethnicities living here. But it's similar in that there's always been a very strict racial hierarchy, which gave one set of people big advantages and privileges over others. Now, again, I think we would do well to remember that we've actually come a very long way in overcoming that. Despite the obvious ongoing injustices in our country, it is a much better place for minorities to live than 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. And a lot of people have started to embrace the idea of an equal multi-ethnic society. But again, there's a lot of people who have something to lose from that and who are rebelling against that. Again, I don't condone that, but it shouldn't surprise us that that is going on. All right, so if you have the anger and the basic distrust of our politics, because people are feeling like, my life's not getting any better, I'm afraid of the future economically. If that often takes a cultural form of a backlash against immigration, a backlash against racial equality, when you add as a third ingredient social media, which makes it so much easier for people to challenge a media consensus, to challenge the gatekeepers who used to say what can be a part of our political discourse and what can't. Now, in some ways, that's a good thing. It's a good thing in dictatorships because the democratic opposition now has a much easier time um, telling, a, uh, telling the population the truth about uh, corruption, about repression, and so on. It can be a good thing in our country as well if you think about the, the, the immense platform that the students at Parkland High in Florida immediately gained after the horrible mass shooting there and their ability to make the voices heard and engage, uh, engage the public in a, in a push for, for change on, on gun control. But at the same time, it also obviously makes it easier for hateful voices, for people who want to spread fake news, sitting here next to Comet Pizza, that's an obvious thing to think about, um, and for people who want to organize radical political movements to actually have a big voice in our politics. So to me, it's these three causes coming together that help to explain not just the rise of Donald Trump, but the rise of similar authoritarian populists in so many different parts of the world. How do people who want to defend liberal democracy not end up looking to lots of others like they are simply defending an establishment and the status quo? And I thought about this a lot during the, um, uh, say, German elections, where I'm, you know, my politics are social democratic, but I kind of found myself wanting Merkel to do reasonably well. I didn't want her to fall, and in a sense, there could be nothing more status quo than rooting for Merkel uh, in Germany. And that I think that there is a, a real danger here that um, that that those of us who want to push back against the dangers of democracy uh, end up looking like protectors of the establishment and the ruling class. How do you respond to that? What's your sort of strategy and approach on that? So uh, I absolutely agree. This is, this is crucial. Um, so the 2016 election in my mind in the United States was a contest between a moderate politics of a status quo and an extremist politics of change. 
Well, it turns out that when those have rules of engagement, the extremist parties of change can win. Not necessarily because most Americans are extremists, but because they really want some promise of a country that changes, that actually delivers more for them. And so what we need to do among people who are more politically moderate is to offer the vision of a real politics of change, to show how without embracing the populist mind frame, how without um, sacrificing the rights of minorities, sacrificing the rights of immigrants and so on, we can actually promise people a real vision of uh, of a better society. And to me, the great failings of Angela Merkel and the Grand Coalition that is now in power again in Germany is that they're not using the big parliamentary majority they had, and still to some degree have, in order to do that. That they aren't actually saying, hey, we are in favor of globalization and free trade and all of those good things, but we are really going to fight to make sure that rich individuals actually pay their tax in, in Germany or the United States. That corporations actually pay a fair amount of tax in these countries. That we make it much easier for productivity to grow in our countries, because that's one of the main drivers of middle class incomes, by investing a ton more money in education and in digital technology. That we are uh, actually making sure that people don't have to keep spending more and more money on the most essential goods from housing to education to healthcare. Now, in all of these countries, these are huge problems. And the establishment parties aren't actually fighting for that. They're not actually saying, here are some ways to radically change the way we run things, the way that we have public policy, in order to ensure that we have a better distribution of the gains from globalization, and by the way, much more productivity growth, much more growth in incomes as well, uh, without thereby um, you know, giving in to the populace. All of these things are possible. Those ideas are out there. Some of them aren't even particularly far-fetched. Employing four or five times more people at the IRS to look after people who are hiding the money in tax havens is a no-brainer. It's really easy to do, and it pays for itself tenfold. So why aren't we doing it? If I would suspect if Hillary Clinton were here or Martin Schultz of the SPD were here, they would both say, that's pretty much what we were suggesting in the campaign, and yet no one noticed that that's what we were suggesting. Is that, would they be right or wrong or half right? They'd be half right at best. So when you look at the, at, at the campaigns, I don't think that they have very radical measures on, on any of those things. Um, but it's also a matter of how you actually talk about those things and sell those things, right? Um, so I think one of the failings to me of a Hillary Clinton campaign was that it never actually set out a vision for America. It basically said, here's a good fix on this, and here's a good fix on this, and here's a good fix on this, um, and here's something that I'm giving this group, and here's something that I'm giving that group. It's not saying, here are the ways in which we're going to make America work for everybody and make it fair to everybody, and here are the ways in which, yes, some things are working, but there's also lots of things that really aren't working. Instead, the message was, uh, you know, America's already great. I'm going to disguise the fact that I have two questions to ask by turning my two questions into one question with a, with a semicolon. Um, and then if people want to start uh, lining up, uh, please uh, feel free. Um, uh, I'd like you to talk about young people because, it, it, you, especially if you look at the United States, and you acknowledge this in the book, especially if you look at the United States, uh, Americans under 30 or Americans under 45 really promise to be the drivers mm -hmm. Uh, for change in a, I think, uh, positive uh, direction in our country. I've told my kids that when my generation is gone, you guys will make things fine, except I want to be around to see it. So there's a <laughs> kind of contradiction there. Um, the, um, and, and yet you have some more, more worries about young people, more in Europe than here, but both. And so I'd like you, um, uh, I'd like you to talk about that. Um, and then secondly, um, I would like you to talk about, sort of in, in hopeful terms, do you look at the response to what you write about in the book um, uh, in Europe or in the United States and see anything coming together that might actually be successful in pushing back against uh, the war on liberal democracy? Or uh, are you still more in a Cassandra mood? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so starting with with young people, I mean, I think. Um, so, so look, the, the figures are quite stark, right? I mean, I've alluded to them a couple of times. May as well say them out loud. So, um, you know, you ask people how important is it to you to live uh, in a democracy among older Americans born in the 1930s and 1940s. Over two thirds say absolutely important. Among millennials born since 1980, less than one third do. When you ask people about whether they think army rule is a good system of government, and, and a lot of these figures are, are in the book, um, 20 years ago, one in 16 Americans said that's a good system of government, now one in six do. And among young and affluent Americans, it's actually gone up from six to 35%, nearly a six fold increase. The counter argument against this, the pushback that I get is, oh, but all of the people who voted for Donald Trump were old people. So the political manifestation of this actually is, uh, is much more among older people than younger people. Now, the first answer to that is what I'm hearing here from the left, which is not true, right? Actually, there was a lot of young people who did vote for Donald Trump. Uh, among uh, white people under the age of 30, 48% voted for Donald Trump and 43% for Hillary Clinton. Which is, which is a very worrying thing. The second thing I would say is that Donald Trump didn't really try to appeal to young people, right? I mean, he's himself a very, you know, an old guy, um, and that's just not what his campaign was, was designed to do. Now, you could easily get forms of authoritarian populism, whether on the right, where there's clearly a, a quite vibrant young old right scene and so on, uh, or for that matter, on, on, on the left, that does try to tap into the deep systemic discontent with democracy that you see among a lot of young people. And the third point is, well, go and look at Europe, and you see that young people are some of the strongest supporters of populist movements on both the left and the right. In the French presidential elections, in the first round, over 50% of young people, over 50% of young people, voted for either Marine Le Pen, the far-right populist, or Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the far-left populist. In Italy, you see that not only did nearly two-thirds of the overall Italian electorate go for either Silvio Berlusconi or the far-right league or the, uh, uh, the five-star movement, which has strong connections to Russia and is run by people who believe that 9-11 was an inside job, but the only demographic am among which there was less the case was the oldest people. Among young people, something like 80% voted for those parties. So, so absolutely, this threat is among young people as well as older people. Now, to a second question of, of how well are we standing up against this. I think there's roughly three scenarios for what's going to happen in the next years in the United States. The first is that Donald Trump does such a terrible job and ends up being repudiated so broadly um, loses so disastrously in the midterms, you know, wins one and a half states in 2020, um, that there's a real moment of coming together and a real recognition of how dangerous it is for people to, to flout the most basic rules of our political system. And not just a recognition that this particular guy failed, but that similar kinds of movements are all dangerous. Now, I think that's possible, but I, I'm not holding my breath for it. The second scenario is the inverse. It is that, like uh, Erdogan has done in Turkey, like Orban is succeeding in doing in Hungary, like it looks like the Polish government may be succeeding in doing in Poland, um, Donald Trump actually manages to expand his base, to deliver for some of his core constituencies, to um, undermine independent institutions like the Department of Justice and, and the FBI. Um, to corrupt the process of elections more and more, and that he essentially becomes a form of dictator over the course of the next six or eight years. Now, again, I think that's possible, but in part because Donald Trump has actually been very incompetent at following the playbook of other authoritarian leaders around the world, in part because he hasn't been very good at delivering for his base, in part because he's not very strategic in his attacks on institutions, but it's always obvious that it's naked self-interest, um, in part because even his rhetoric always seems to be a little bit more about himself and about setting up that I essential <laughs> contra <laughs> contrast between himself and the people and so on, I I I'm hopeful that that's not going to happen. And in part because there's a great resistance movement of Americans actually heeding and taking seriously those people who were once called Cassandras uh, 
um, and going out to, to, to resist Donald Trump in all kinds of concrete ways. My big fear now, and I talk about this in the book, is the third scenario, what I would call the Roman scenario, by which I had in mind the late Roman Republic, but it, given the elections a week ago, I guess I may also be talking about Rome today, which is that you have a populist figure uh, like the Gracchi in Rome, or like Silver Berlusconi in Italy, for that matter, that exploits deep discontent with the political system and comes to the political stage, cre creates a huge constitutional crisis, and after a bunch of years is thrown out of the system again. Tiberius Gracchus was, was killed. Silver Berlusconi ended up uh, resigning in disgrace in 2011. But because the underlying reasons for this discontent aren't being tackled, because we're not doing a good enough job of making sure that ordinary people actually get an improvement of the living standards. Because we're not creating an inclusive patriotism that emphasizes what unites us across racial and religious lines rather than what, what divides us. Um, you, you have this similar kind of energy coming back. Six years later, like now in Italy, uh, 10 years later, as happened with, with uh, Tobias Krakos' younger brother. And so over the course of perhaps 20, perhaps 40, perhaps 60 years, you slowly get such an erosion of a political system that you wind up in dictatorship. That, to me, is the biggest fear. But this is not a matter of dealing with it in 2020, of dealing with it in 2018. It's something that we're going to be fighting, not just for the rest of your lifetime, EJ, but for the rest of the, the lifetime of a few young Don't people in this in. crowd as well. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the inclusive patriotism because it's a, one of the things actually our books share in common and Ayasha wrote a very good piece in the New York Times about a week ago but that doesn't mean you can look it up on Google and not buy the book you know? <laughs> uh, Jeremy can you introduce yourselves when you ask a question if you don't mind is the mic working yes okay uh, yes I'm, I'm Jeremiah Reamer um, uh, this is not a plan DJ asked me to ask a provocative question earlier but um, but I just thought it up my my, um, my question has to do with um, uh, you have a, uh, a, a term I'm not completely uh, satisfied with to, to talk about the, uh, the opposite of the, uh, of the democratic populists. Um, you call them, I think, is it undemocratic liberals? And um, I guess my question goes to whether uh, they're really undemocratic or incapable of making a democratic connection, because I actually think a lot of these people want to be democratic, but they're unable to make a kind of a connection to electoral politics and to the kind of successful model uh, where they, um, where sort of their expertise, uh, their professional knowledge was consulted and valued, and then big tent party political leaders were able to use that. Um, but I think they want to be democratic. Um, you know, there's a tendency to view uh, technocrats as just bad, but I think there are good technocrats and bad technocrats. I think Mario Draghi is kind of a good technocrat, along with Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke. They did some good things. So my question um, it, to you is, uh, and by the way, um, this is related to another uh, observation I made about the Trump um, reaction to Trump. Among the most aggrieved people about the Trump election are people uh, who are professional civil servants, who feel they have professional expertise. It's not just the fact that they're cosmopolitan hipsters living in bi-coastal cities. They also feel their professional knowledge useful for government is being completely ignored. How can those people, how do you think the, the good technocrats, so to speak, if you agree with my, my term, uh, can, can remake a connection? Uh, I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah. so yeah, go ahead. So, so, I love so, the idea, by the way, of a GS-14 being a bi-coastal hipster. They would <laughs> probably enjoy that, but go ahead. Um, so I think the, the, the short answer is that the term is undemocratic liberal rather than anti-democratic liberal. So, so in that sense, I agree. But just, 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 just to explain that term a little bit to people who haven't read the book. So one of the arguments I make is that you know, we need to think of our political system as having these two elements, liberal democracy. Now, liberal has nothing to do with liberal and conservative. It's not you know, Barack Obama versus George W. Bush. It is a, 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 a commitment to individual rights, to, um, to the rights of minorities, to the rule of law, to the separation of powers. And democracy, in my mind, then becomes actually translating popular views into public policies. Unless we're actually managing to make sure that our political system is responsive to what people want, it doesn't seem to me very democratic. Now, what I think is happening in the world is two things. On the one side, for a long time, 
we've had a system of rights without terribly much democracy, of undemocratic liberalism, which is to say a system in which, yes, we do a reasonably good job at protecting individual rights and minority rights and uh, the separation of powers, but we're not doing a great job of ensuring that we're actually translating what people think into policy. And that's the case because of a huge role of money in politics, because of a revolving door between lobbyists and legislators. Uh, yes, because of a certain uh, uh, elite class that doesn't have much circulation with ordinary people, but also because a lot of bureaucratic and technocratic institutions that do do a great job take lots of issues out of democratic contestation, so that lots of decisions are made by the Supreme Court, by an independent central bank, um, by international organizations, are precluded from politics through, through trade treaties. And you take all of those things together, and it's not surprising when lots of people say, nobody's really listening to me, right? Now, we need to understand that to understand part of a populist instinct, which is the inverse. It's not rights or democracy, it's democracy without rights. It's saying, we are going to speak for a majority and actually put forward all of the politically incorrect ideas that people actually like. Now, often, unfortunately, those ideas really are popular. When you look in Switzerland, where there was a referendum, as a result of which the Swiss constitution now reads, I quote, there's freedom of religion in Switzerland. The building of minarets is forbidden. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. That shows that actually a majority of Swiss people did want to restrict the rights of a Muslim minority there. Now, the problem with that is that eventually a liberal democracy, rights, a democracy without rights, degenerates into straightforward dictatorship. Because once you've taken away separation of powers, once you have put your own people in the courts, in the electoral commission, as has happened in Hungary, in the media, the opposition no longer has a real chance of getting rid of a government. So, um, you know, between those two evils, I think I know which one I would pick. Um, but in order to deal with the underlying drivers of this populist anger, we need to find ways to make our political system more responsive to what people want. And even though a lot of technocratic institutions do a great job, I think we need to recognize that they have problematic aspects to them. Thank you. Well, you kind of um, answered some of the questions I have, but let me just make this statement and let you comment. The democratic state has to rein in the forces that are trying to destroy it. And those are very various, like the big money, uh, corrupt press, the preventing people from voting, not educating them to the point that they vote for the um, man who wants to be dictator. If we don't do that, we have to be, to watch, be watchful. Uh, countries, and we know what happened in, in Germany, what happened in other countries, Eastern Europe, we're talking about. They are not becoming democracies. They are losing their, their freedom. And, and, uh, and people just let that happen. You know, and if we don't, we are not alert to what is happening, why do we believe what we hear in some uh, radio or television station? Why is that allowed to happen? Lying every day to the people. Thank well, so, 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 so one of the things that I think is really important is to actually you know, educate people about the values of our political system and how our political system works. One of the reasons why there's more and more information online is because of the rise of the internet and of social media and so on. Um, but I think it goes beyond just the existence of Facebook and Twitter. Things can spread because people don't trust the government. And they don't trust the government because, A, we don't really know how it works because we barely teach civics anymore in high schools, right? And, B, because even in so far as we do know how it works, we only see the negative things in our political system. Now, this is something that I say... Um, that could have it where I teach, and my faculty colleagues aren't too pleased with me for it, which is that we need to actually tell people what's good about our political system as well. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be uncritical. doesn't mean that we shouldn't also be upfront about the shortcomings of our political system and the ways in which people continue to suffer injustice and discrimination. But if we only talk about those things and never say about explain how it is, what it is that animates our political system and why it is that living in the United States for all of its problems is still a lot better than living in Russia or Iran uh, or, or, or China or Venezuela, then we shouldn't be surprised that people are willing to throw all of that away. And so I think you know, one of the things that we can all do 
with our uh, uh, children, with our siblings, with our parents, with uh, if you're a teacher, with your students, if you're a writer or a journalist, with w in your articles, um, is to actually recommit people to those political values, from Plato to Aristotle and from um, Rousseau to the Founding Fathers. All of the great thinkers about self-government knew how crucial it is to transmit our political values from one generation to the next. And we might have paid a little bit of lip service to that in the last 30, 40 years, but we've stopped taking it seriously, and that's a big problem. I've been thinking that the last 14 months are brought to you by Joni Mitchell. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. And could I bring in, uh, could the folks at the store tell me when we should shut down? I could be up here all day talking to Yasha. Um, Actually, uh, we'll take two more questions and then... Oh, is that all we have? Yeah, sorry. No. Oh. Um, oh. I'm sorry. Um, actually, can I amend that? If people are brief, let me just take four questions fast, all at once, and then Yasha can give a very compact answers because he wants to sell books. So four quick. Thank you. Um, my name is Don Greenhouse from the Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, New York, where EJ has lectured a number of times. And we place. invite you all to come and hear some discussions just like this. Very quickly, I can't remember her name, an author, recent uh, book called Strangers in Their Own Land. Uh, Ali Hochschild. Uh, and she uses a metaphor, so I'd like you to think about it in terms of micro rather than macro sense of these. We're all lined up back from the pot of gold, and we're all standing quietly in line, and our liberal democracy keeps bringing people into the line in front of us, the blacks, the gays, et cetera, et cetera. And this is causing this angst and populism. I wonder if you might comment. Hang on, hold that thought. Thank you, sir. Stuart Schultz, I'll, I'll try to make this really quick and condense it, but uh, you've identified populism, you know, this lack of agency, this uh, lack of, of uh, economic opportunity, threat to cultural identity as the major threat to liberal democracy. And I can't speak to the international situation, but at least domestically, Trump ran on all those things. But his actual administration has nothing to do with any of that message. It has to do with advancing corporate interests. And it's, it seems to me that the, the real threat to liberal democracy is not in these issues, which are real, but in the forces that use those issues to advance agendas that are more dangerous to liberal democracy. I mean, what's the role in capital in all of this? So it's clear that um, Donald Trump is a symptom of broader underlying causes. Um, as he undermines institutions, are we doing a good enough job to deal with the underlying causes, or are we just saying he's undermined this institution, therefore Donald Trump is bad? Would that be an excellent thing to close on? And lastly, sorry for the rest. Yeah, uh, my name is Avery James. I'm a sophomore at American University. Um, quick question. You mentioned how we need, and you actually had an op-ed in the New York Times on this as well, this new nationalism, this new patriotism. I would just ask, how is that in any way unique from what Marco Rubio wanted in 2013? How is that in any way unique from what Jeb Bush, who was bankrolled by the Republican Party, basically Mitt Romney, but he's fluent in Spanish this time? I mean, how is that any different from what the people who had the power to make decisions in the Republican Party wanted? and ended up with what we have. I mean, that, how is it non-unique, right? Like, that's the question I really have, is how does that change the current trend? Thanks. All right, um, I, I might need some, some reminders, but, but I'll try and get through these four questions quickly and then say something inspiring at the end. There we go, that's my task. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, so Stark, cutting... I'm gonna read the last four sentences of the second book. So. Please, that's... Uh, so, 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 so the cutting in line metaphor, I think, is quite powerful, and, 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 and that, that that's how a lot of people think about it, right? That, that, they've, um, that they're frustrated, they're not getting what they want, they want they've been promised a pot of gold, they're still signing in line for it. And now, why are other people doing well? Like, for me, that precisely explains the lunacy of pretending that cultural factors and economic factors are, is either one or the other. This is the way in which it's connected. But if people feel like I'm getting a fair shake and I, I'm a lot wealthier than my parents were and my kids are going to do better than me, and you know what? That guy over there is doing fine too. Good for him. You know, he's not like me. He's an immigrant or he's whatever, right? But, but I'm doing fine. Nice that he's doing fine too. When people start to feel, you know what? Um, I've been taken advantage of all my life and politicians aren't really delivering for me and my community is falling apart in all kinds of ways and there's 
an opioid epidemic and, and our incomes are stagnating and the good union jobs are gone, and now why is that guy over there doing fine? It's easy to scapegoat and blame, right? And so one of the ways of dealing with that is to make sure that we actually deliver on the American dream for people in the way that, 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 that we promised. Um, on inclusive patriotism, I mean, I think that there is a deep store of inclusive patriotism in, uh, in American political history. Um, I think often people didn't necessarily act on that. So, uh, you know, in the end, though, I agree that some modern Republicans had perfectly decent rhetoric around it. Uh, most of them weren't willing to actually vote in those ways and, 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 and ensure that we take those issues off the table through some kind of comprehensive deal where we come to a decision about that. I also think that uh, there is a little bit of resistance to it on, on parts of the left, right? So what we have at the moment is a, a right politically who says, let's talk about nationalism all of the time, but let's talk about it in exclusive ways, basically the kind of form of white nationalism of which I would argue our current president is guilty. But then on the left, I think there's an instinct that I know quite well because I grew up with it, which is to say, hey, nationalism can be so destructive, and it was so destructive in the 20th century, why don't we actually move beyond it? Leave nationalism behind in the century which it so cruelly shaped. And that um, you know, allows us to be cosmopolitans, or allows us to not have any strong collective identity, whatever. That's one kind of approach. The other approach is to say, we're going to celebrate every form of collective identity at the subnational level, every religious group, every ethnic group, every sexual group, and so on, but we're not going to celebrate the nation. Because the nation is bad and has this very bad history, and the other things are under attack. Now, I agree that we need to defend every group from attack and discrimination that is ongoing. But I also think that the nation can actually be a great store of solidarity. That it can be precisely the thing that allows you to see why you should care about somebody who doesn't have the same skill, doesn't have skin color, doesn't have the same religion, and so on. With you. And that emphasizing that in an inclusive manner is a way to build social solidarity and fight discrimination rather than a way to advance it. So to me, nationalism is a half-domesticated animal. And instead of leaving it on its own to be stoked and prodded by the worst kind of people, I think that we need to domesticate it. One nice way of doing that in a political speech, and I have many disagreements with him on other things, uh, is what Emmanuel Macron said in Marseille on the campaign trail. He said, when looking at this audience, I see people from Mali and the Ivory Coast and, and Algeria and Italy and Poland. But what do I see? I see the people of Marseille. What do I see? I see the people of France. Look here, ladies and gentlemen, of the Front National, the far-right party of Marine Le Pen. This is what it looks like to be proud to be French. That, to me, is a nationalism that actually makes sense. And, and I think parts of the right could fight for it more strongly, and I think parts of the left could also fight for it more strongly. There's two questions that I'm missing here. I think there was one on corporations. And, yeah. and one on... Oh, I, so, um, okay, so the question about corporations, look, I mean, I think that um, liberal democracy works when democracy and capitalism are unbalanced. I don't think the answer is to abolish capitalism because there is no democratic country that has ever existed on the face of the earth without capitalism. And while I get right-wing critiques of globalization because the standard of living of uh, steel workers in Michigan really hasn't improved that much over the last 30 years, I think it's because of our political choices rather than because of globalization, but at least I get it, I don't really understand certain forms of left-wing critique of globalization because if you actually say that you care about the well-being of poor people in the world, and you look at the fact that two billion people have been lifted out of dire poverty in India and China over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, people who didn't have electricity, who didn't have food to eat, who didn't have an education, who now ha lead middle-class lives, I think we need to recognize what awesome positively power it has. But we need to also make sure that we actually use those fruits in order to deliver for ordinary people. Now, some countries have done much better than, this, than other countries, and it's not because they're more or less capitalist, it's because they've pursued policies that are actually directed to helping ordinary people. And that's in part because money had much less of a hold on their politics than it does in our country. So this is not rocket science, it's solvable. But we need to fight to solve it. It's gonna be hard to solve it. All right. <laughs>
I'm going to end with, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sometimes told that uh, when I talk or, you know, when people read my articles, but it can be a little depressing. So, so thanks for coming out to, to get depressed on a, on a Sunday afternoon with, with lovely sunny weather. But, but I actually genuinely think, uh, and I think your book, One Nation Under Trump, brings that out really beautifully as well, EJ, that this is a moment to be inspired, um, despite all the ugliness in our politics. When I grew up politically, when I came of age politically, came of age politically it seemed like what we would do wouldn't matter that much. Because yes, there's some policies that were better and some policies that were worse. There was some ongoing discrimination and injustice. But in the end, we sort of knew what the world was going to look like 30 or 35 years from now, right? Now we don't know that. And it's up to how we act to ensure how that's going to look. So yes, that's scary. And yes, it's easy to get depressed by that. But it's also easy to get inspired by that because it means that we can actually act. Um, the best picture image for this, in my mind, comes from Amos Oz, who says there's a huge fire burning. And each of us only has a little glass of water in the hand. And, and it can seem hopeless. If I go to the water and I dump my little glass of water on it, on the fire, that's not going to change anything. The fire is far too big. Well, but thanks for coming out, everybody. There's a lot of people in this room. And if each of us takes our glass of water and dumps it on the fire, then together we might just be able to extinguish it. Now, the way to do that is to fight for real change in our system, not just to defeat Donald Trump. It's to actually make sure that our political system delivers for ordinary people again. It's to make sure that people see what's valuable in our political system again. And if you agree with some of my descriptions and diagnoses today, you'll have an idea of what you can go and do at home. If you disagree, then you'll have your own ideas. But, but the important thing is that unlike people in Turkey, unlike people in Russia, unlike people in Venezuela, we still have a freedom to go and fight and organize and mobilize politically and argue. And so I think it's our duty to do that. And the Yasha for Congress PAC will be collecting <laughs> signatures up here. Um, I, I want to read just the last words of the book because they fit so well with what Yasha said. He said, nobody can promise us a happy end, but those of us who truly care about our values and our institutions are determined to fight for our convictions without regard for the consequences. Though the fruits of our labor may remain uncertain, we will do what we can to save liberal democracy. Thank you all for coming out, and Yasha will sign the books. <laughs>